let's make our cluster highly available. In this video, we're going to be making our control plane highly available. How are we going to do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to add two more control plane nodes to the cluster, giving us a three in total. And then we're going to pop a load balancer in front of that. So when requests come in from kubectl, it will hit the load balancer and then distribute that amongst the three nodes. That means that if one node goes down, the other two can still respond. Highly available. The way we're going to do this, though, is we're not going to install HAProxy. We're not going to install Kemp or F5 or anything like that. We don't need extra nodes for this. We're just going to use a project called kubefip or kubevip. And the way that works is it deploys a pod into the cluster, which is essentially communicating with your network via BGP or ARP and it will present a virtual IP out, like any random IP that you can think of on your network. And then when you hit that, that accepts the requests and passes it off through to the control plane nodes. It's a very simplified way of putting it, but that's that's what it does. There's another project as well called Metal LB. I do use that when I'm talking about ingress controllers and things like that, but Kubevip seems to work best for control planes, in my opinion. Um, I met the guy who wrote the project at the Kubernetes community days I went to and Kube Huddle, I think it was called, I'm forgetting the name of it now, that I went up to in Edinburgh recently. And it's a really interesting story about how it came about, actually. I won't tell the story today, but you can go and check it out. I'll actually leave a video to the Kubernetes community days talk that he did recently in the description below, and you can check it out yourself. But yeah, it's a really interesting project. It works really well, and it's so simple to set up. It uses kubeadm, you just give it a manifest, chuck it in the manifest directory and kubeadm deploys the pods for you and then it just works. So we'll be using that for our load balancer. Let's get going. So here we are in VirtualBox and all I've done is added two new Ubuntu nodes. I've set them up in the same way as I did this one here and I'm up to a point now where all I need to do is add them to the cluster. So they already have kubeadm installed, they already have container D installed. Basically follow the previous video through all the way up to the point where I actually run kubeadm in it and you'll be where I am. So with that in mind, let's move on. In here, we have Tmux open. We've got the original control plane here. So if I just run kubectl get nodes and watch that, we can see here's the cluster that I've set up originally. It's got one control plane and three worker nodes. It is worth noting though, what I did do before running this video was reset the cluster. And instead of running kubeadm in it with the IP address, I've actually run kubeadm in it with the DNS, like I said, I should have done at the end of the previous video. So just for the sake of brevity, I will quickly show you that. So I've run this and I've replaced the IP address with the DNS address that I set up in ETC hosts here. That's the only difference, okay? So it will work in the same way, but obviously, as I said at the end of the previous video, by setting it up with the IP, it kind of defeated the point of having this DNS record because if I decided to change this IP, then the cluster would stop working in terms of the um, certificates that were generated for it. So by switching it to the DNS record, I can change this IP to whatever I want. And as long as this here points to this, everything will continue to work. So over here, I also have those set up. So I have that same DNS record set up on these nodes here. So we're good to go. So I'm just gonna synchronize my panes. And all I'm gonna do now is add these two nodes to the cluster. So let me just remove that synchronization. We'll start watching the nodes again. And all I need to do now is set up the kubevit manifest ready, and then I need to add the nodes to the cluster. So the easiest way to do this would be to grab the manifest from etc kubernetes manifest. And then if we just have a couple of times, we should see one called kubevit.yaml. Oh, tmux might not be very friendly with this here, so bear with me. Yep, there we go, that's fine. And all I'm gonna do over here is open up Vim at etc kubernetes manifests kubevip.yaml and I'm going to do set mouse minus equals a and uh, set paste. The reason I've done those two is just to make sure it pastes properly because sometimes if you don't set those it will paste in a weird way. In fact I'll show you on the other node when I do it just for the sake of showing you what I've just done there. So I'll paste that in. Let me just validate this make sure it looks good. There should be a interface environment variable somewhere. So we've got EMP OS3 here. I just need to make sure that that is still valid. So let me just get IPA EMP OS3. Yep, that's fine. I'm gonna have to recopy that because Teamwork automatically copies for me, hopefully. And we'll grab that. Then over on this node, we'll do the same. ETC, Kubernetes manifests, kubevip, vip.yaml. 
and just for the sake of showing what would have happened if I hadn't set those other bits in Vim. There you go, that's what I was talking about, which we don't want. So again, set mouse minus equals A and set paste. I think I only need the set paste on that, but I just do the minus equals A on the mouse. Anyway, it's just habit more than anything. So we'll paste those in and again, just come up here and validate EMP OS3 and that should be fine. So I'll just check that IPA EMP OS3. Yep, I've got the same interface name, so good to go. Okay, so let's uh, just clear those two screens. So I'm gonna come up here again and watch these nodes. And I'm gonna sit on these until they come up as not ready. And I'm fairly confident they will come up as ready. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is once this is finished, I'm actually go, gonna go ahead and watch the pods in the cube system namespace. And the reason I'm gonna do that is I wanna show you what happens here. It's like what extra things get added essentially. We can see here we've got one, two, three, four proxies. We should get another two of them. Uh, we should see another API server, controller manager and scheduler appear. And and we should see some more Coleco nodes. So yeah, we should see some of those things up here. What I'm gonna do is cancel out that for now though, go back to the nodes. And what I'm gonna do is grab the join command that I copied, you know, when I reset this cluster up. But again, if you followed the previous video and you did switch that DNS over, then you should be able to copy along here. If not, then you might find that this join command has an IP address here instead. Don't worry about that. If it does, it does. It's not the end of the world. This is just for the sake of showing you how a few things work. Remember, we're going to be wiping out these clusters anyway after this video and setting it up with an external ETCD nodes in the next video. And then that will be the cluster we use moving forward through the series. I want to make sure we've got an external, uh, a separate ETCD set of nodes, just so I can show you how to interact with ETCD as well. So just before I hit enter on these, what I'm actually going to do is bring the document in so we can have a read through. So as I say, we'll be doing an external ETCD in the next one, but here we'll have a stacked ETCD. So yeah, this is having the uh, three or more machines that meet cube ADM's minimum requirements, which we've already done. And yeah, we're, we're pretty much good to go. So let's just scroll through and just see if we need to do anything else on here. I suspect we'll need to copy some certificates over and things like like that but let's just have a read through so first steps for both methods create the load balance for cube api server we've already done this this is our cube vip so that's going to be good to go and let's have a look here we have that sorted we have this upload certs here so what we should have done was actually add this on the original one so let's see if we can make that now have the um, elements that we need essentially so let's just have a look through see if we can add some nodes to it manual certificate distribution that should work for us. You know, if you choose not to use kubeadm in it with the upload search flag, this means that you are going to have to manually copy the certificate from the primary control plane node to the joining control plane nodes. Basically, if we do this, when we run kubeadm in it on the secondary and tertiary nodes, as it were, the control plane nodes, then it would automatically pull these certificates down. But because we didn't do this originally, because we were setting up a single control plane node in the previous video, we now have to do manual certificate distribution. So to make sure that we can manage this as we need to, we basically need to allow SSH between in the control plane nodes and then we need to go ahead and copy all of these bits across so i'm not going to get into all of this right now because you should know how to ssh between some nodes if you don't know how to do that i have a linux series that i did previously that shows about ssh and things like that so i'm not going to be running through this very in depth but i will just quickly go through and sort this now so all I need to do is go ahead and quickly set up an SSH connection between the two, and then I'll be able to just copy the certificates across in place and it'll all be fine and dandy. So to do this, I ideally need to copy it to the you know correct location on the host, but because I don't have root access via SSH and I'm not gonna go ahead and change the passwords for these root users here, uh, what I will need to do is as root, copy across to the Ubuntu user and then move them into place. So to do that, I'm gonna have to do SSH key jump. And we'll just save that in, not bother about any passwords because we're going to delete all these connections afterwards. And then what I shall do is just copy my ID across to these two nodes. So we'll do uh, SSH, copy ID, uh, Ubuntu at one, let's just spell Ubuntu at 192.168.0.02. And then we'll add the password and then change that for three. And yes, and add the password. And there we go. That's set. So now I should be able to SSH Ubuntu at 192.168.0.202. Yeah, that's fine. And 203. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's up and running. So all I need to do now, I can scroll past this because essentially all this is doing is telling you how to do that sort of stuff um, with a little bit more detail. I'm not going to go into the details here because like I say, you should know SSH if you're doing this. If you don't, go and have a look at one of the other videos that I've done. So user equals Ubuntu. We need that because we're copying to the Ubuntu user on these two. And my control plane IPs are... Let's just get these changed. 
uh, not them, so it's 192.168.0.202 and 192.168.0.203. So I'll set them and then let's just have a look. So it says skip this line here if you're using external ETCD. Well, we're not, so we are going to need this and we will go ahead and you know what? We can just copy all of that and paste it in. So what this is going to do is for each IP address in the IP address listed, copy this file over to the host. That's it. It will copy it to the home directory of the host. So we should see them appear in here which we have nothing in here at the moment, so that's fine. So I'll paste that in, hit enter. These will all get copied across. And, oh, is it just copied it? Oh, I'm in root still on, of course. So, yeah, there we go. So we can see them in there. So uh, home Ubuntu, just make sure both of them have them. Cool, okay, so what we'll do now is we'll move these certificates into place, simple as. So again, let's have a look. So then on each join in the control plane node, Run the following scripts before running kubemadm join. Yeah, well, that's absolutely fine. So I'll grab this and of these two, we'll put these in place. Again, we'll do this all as root because we're going to need permissions to access etc kubernetes directory and we're not going to be able to do that as you want to. So again, we'll just copy all of this and we will paste that in there and we'll paste that in there and we should be good to go now. So now what I'll do is go and grab that kubemadm join command. So if I just do a reverse search for join, we should have both of them there. And yep, there they are. So kubeadm join API server 6443. I'll just make sure these tokens are correct. Yep, so that's fine. That works for me. And I'm gonna hit enter on those two now. So before I do, we'll start that watch off command again. And I'll just need to export because I've dropped out now. So now I can watch and we will run those. It should pick up all of those certificates, which it has. And we should start to see those nodes appear here any second. Okay, so there's control plane one. And we should see control plane two come up once this finishes its pre-flight checks. I'm not sure why it's taking so long, but what I'm gonna do now is go back to the pods one that I wanted to look at. And we'll just keep an eye on this. So let's have a look. We just had an error with kubevip then interestingly. So I need to keep my eye on that and find out why that's happening. Um, I could look into the logs, but at the moment I know it's working because you know, it's, it's, it is working, it's there. It's all there, it's right now. It's, you know, I wouldn't be able to use this if kubevip wasn't working because if we have a look at our kube config, and it's uh, admin. We can see here the server it's using is the DNS address. It's not the IP address. I know it's working, it's fine. So yeah, here we go. I'm just gonna drag this down a little bit. Both nodes have finished their init commands and we should now see, yep, yeah, we've got two new ones here. And then we've got these two ETCD nodes that have appeared. Uh, pods, sorry, not nodes. And then we've got these two ETCD pods that have appeared. We've got these two API servers that appeared, two more proxies that have appeared, two more schedulers which is here and oh we're still waiting for another scheduler to appear actually so that's fine and yeah we've got another cube vip and yeah it's it's all coming together so let's just keep our eye on this we should see another scheduler appear and another controller manager so if we actually look back at nodes one might not be ready still no it's, it's ready so we should see them coming up ah there we go that one's just come up there and we're still waiting for a controller manager to come in as well so we'll just give that a few more minutes and once that's in, we've added our additional nodes and we are good to go. They are ready to start serving as control plane nodes. It means that a control plane node can go down and it will still work. And I will show that. There we go. So we've got this pending now, look, see, and that's running. Okay. So what is the benefit of this? Well, the benefits of this is, well, it's high availability, isn't it? So let's export the configs on these two. And I'm going to synchronize my panes just for the second. And we'll do kubectl. Uh, get pods name cube system watch and let's watch what happens when I shut down the original node so let's unsynchronize those panes I'm going to go ahead and shut this down so we've just lost a control plane that's what's happening now so we can see if I look at VirtualBox that this particular node is starting to shut down so if I just bring this up I should just be able to click show I think yep and here it is this is going down now so it's shutting down altogether but what we should also see is whilst that's happening we still have access to kubectl it, it lost connection because it was clearly hitting the other node first, which is fine. But what will happen is we will still be able to access things via the Kube API server because we have high availability, which means these two are now serving the requests instead. So if I just move this out of the way, that's still shutting down. But this, this is how it works. This is the benefit of having high availability. We've just lost a node. It's going down and we can still interface with Kubernetes, which is really useful. So we'll just wait for that to finish. Okay, there we go, that's gone. Yet, if we look here, 
let's just clear the screen we can still access everything it's all there there we go now you may notice that we still have these in place technically they're not running anymore they have gone but the, the whole point here is i can still interact with kubernetes i can still deploy pods to it i can still access everything i need to because i have two other control plane nodes available if i now go ahead and do qttl get nodes what we will see is that one is marked as not ready. Now, this means that it's still in the cluster. If I start that node up again, it will just re-associate itself with the cluster and this will become ready again. And I will quickly start that node up just to show that process. So let's power this back on. And then when that's finished coming up, we will see this become ready again. So let's just watch this node. We will continue watching everything. So let's just push that down. Okay, so we lost a connection there. I imagine that's because we've just had another node starting to come on. Yep, here we are. We can see now these new nodes coming in. We will rerun this and there we go, it's ready. So there we go, up and running back in the cluster. Those nodes are all coming back up. So they'll be marked as restarted in some cases, but yeah. They, they have it. So that actually went down as not ready and then came straight back up again. We could look into that. Maybe we could have a look at the kubelet on that particular node and see why that happened. There would be something in the logs. I'm not going to be doing that now because that's not what this video is about. But yeah, there we have it. High availability nodes on Kubernetes. And you can see it's all working as we would expect. And there we have it. We have highly available control planes now. So we've pretty much mimicked a production cluster now. We have a three node control plane with as many worker nodes as we would wish. We have three, but you, know, you can just keep adding worker nodes as much as you want. There is a limit, but I'm not going to get into that right now. And yeah, it's 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 all up and running. It's good to go. We can start using this cluster now. I'm considering re-rolling it once more and having ETCD sit external. That's That was my original plan, as I've already mentioned multiple times. However, in planning for that video, I've discovered that KubeADM is no longer the preferred way of doing this. They're actually developing a tool called ETCD ADM. And that tool is essentially going to be a dedicated way of spinning up separate ETCD nodes. So I'm still undecided on whether I'm going to go for that or not. I was going to install Cilium on my cluster going forward throughout this tutorial. So I think either way, I'm going to probably do one more video, either doing ETCD externally and Cilium at the same time, or just replacing Coleco for Cilium. I'm still undecided about which way I'm going to go about this and the best way to go about this. I don't think ETCD externally is required. It's up to you if you want to do it. It's good in case your control plane nodes completely explode and then you've still got your state you know, on separate nodes. But to be honest, if control plane explodes, you're probably in trouble anyway. So I don't know. Maybe it's not required for this video, this, this video series. You'll know anyway in the next video when it comes up. It will either be, here's how to replace Coleco with Cilium, or it will be, here's how to set up a highly available cluster with ETCD externally. So whichever one it is, I'll see you in the next one.